A victim of the press or just playing one for the cameras, Meghan Markle landed the prince and the fairy tale ending. So how'd she wind up the villain in the eyes of the public? Do you remember that old movie Princess Diaries with Anne Hathaway? Doesn't happen. Meghan Markle has always been proud of her biracial heritage, having advocated for both race and gender equality long before she became the Duchess of Sussex. However, when Markle fell in love with Prince Harry, many people, especially Britons, focused more on the race part and less on the love part. Indeed, it seems some of the hatred surrounding Markle involves nothing more than the colour of her skin. From the moment Markle stepped on the scene, there was a level of downright disgust from people all over the globe. Birmingham University professor Kiende Andrews told CNN it was never going to end well. The British royal family is one of the premier symbols of whiteness in the world. She was never going to be fully accepted. This wasn't more evident than when Markle became pregnant with her first child. Speaking with Oprah Winfrey, she claimed that someone in the royal family was concerned with the baby's skin tone. The accusation got a response from the firm, with Prince William going on the defence. He told reporters, We are very much not a racist family. One thing Meghan Markle detractors often say is that she is really good at playing the victim. In fact, some of Markle's harshest critics have accused her of having a sort of woe-is-me attitude, which hasn't gone over well with the masses. For many, it seems as though Markle's attempts to tell her story and to set the record straight involve details designed to make people feel bad for her. So I needed to learn a lot, including the national anthem. How did you learn it? Oh, I googled it. In response to the Harry and Meghan docuseries release on Netflix, journalist Marjorie Wallace said on the Difficult Woman podcast in January 2023, I don't like victimhood and I've never played it myself. I don't really think playing the victim card helps. Whatever you're the victim of, I don't really respect people who take victimhood on as a career. Accusations of Markle's victim mentality go beyond what she experienced living in the confines of the royal family for two years. During an episode of her Archetypes podcast, for example, Markle discussed her time on Deal or No Deal, opening up about how she felt objectified and the internet hated every minute. After the podcast episode was released, conservative political commentator Stephen Crowder tweeted, It's never Meghan Markle's fault. It's always someone else's fault. That's what you call a narcissist. In October 2018, at least one of Meghan Markle's aides is said to have made a formal complaint, alleging the Duchess of Sussex had bullied her. In response, Markle's spokesperson released a statement which read, The Duchess is saddened by this latest attack on her character, particularly as someone who has been the target of bullying herself and is deeply committed to supporting those who have experienced pain and trauma. Buckingham Palace was quick to launch an investigation into the claims, though the findings were kept private. Meanwhile, a source told Fox News Digital that the palace required staff members to sign NDAs to keep things of this nature under wraps, which could be why the case was closed without any additional information supplied to the public. Journalist Valentine Lowe, who wrote the initial report, told Newsweek in October 2022, these were people who felt they had suffered while working for Meghan. After the whole ordeal, Prince Harry went on record defending his wife during an episode of his docuseries The Me You Can't See. He felt that the whole thing was meant to slander his wife and place blame on the palace as well as the media. I was woken up in the middle of the night to her crying in her pillow because she doesn't want to wake me up because I'm already carrying too much. Meghan Markle and Prince Harry's decision to step down as senior members of the royal family and move out of the UK was really a tipping point, not only for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, but also for people who had been so highly critical of Meghan in recent years. In an interview with Anderson Cooper, Harry explained that his family was rather uncomfortable with bringing Markle into the fold, quote, right from the beginning, before they even had a chance to get to know her. But when the duo announced they'd be leaving the royal family, Markle became public enemy number one. Most of the hate towards Markle comes from the idea that she was the sole cause of breaking up a family, and not just any family. In a Reddit thread titled, Meghan Markle ruined Prince Harry's life, one person made the claim, she just isn't a good person and she 100% ruined his whole ass life with her BS. But the criticism didn't stop there, even though Harry has made it clear that he's long felt that royal life wasn't for him. Since his departure, Harry's relationship with his family has become even more strained, and many royal fans feel that Markle is to blame. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's sit-down interview with Oprah Winfrey is likely their most criticised. While the interview was ratings gold, the reviews were mixed. Perhaps the main criticism came from people trying to understand why the duo, who left the UK to seek out peace and privacy, went on national television to spill some tea. Others seemed upset that Markle essentially put Harry's family on blast, regardless of how she feels or what she says they did or didn't do to help her during her time of need. But that they were willing to lie to protect other members of the family, but they weren't willing to tell the truth to protect me and my husband.
On a New York Times article asking for feedback on the interview, commenters didn't hold back. I find it quite sad that Harry and Meghan would decide to air such serious allegations about the monarchy, his family, on national TV. I think they really misjudged how this interview would be perceived. Meghan and Harry's truth has more holes than Swiss cheese. I think this interview was a calculated exercise to try and get the couple the popularity they need to make a living in the US. Were you silent or were you silenced? The latter. Others felt the interview was in poor taste because it was filmed after Prince Philip had been hospitalized. The interview aired just weeks before Prince Philip's death, with his health being a major concern for the family at the time. The hate surrounding Meghan Markle has only increased each time someone has caught her in a lie. On an episode of their Netflix show, Harry and Meghan, for example, Markle made it known that she always chose to wear muted tones so as not to interfere with Queen Elizabeth's wardrobe choices. Most of the time that I was in the UK, I rarely wore color. Within hours, there were photos and videos on social media of the Duchess of Sussex in the brightest outfits. Markle also claimed that some of her personal belongings were taken from her upon entry into the royal family, like her passport. Many pointed out, however, that the well-traveled Duchess wouldn't have been able to get into other countries without the document. Someone who has been extremely critical of Markle is journalist and television personality Piers Morgan. Following Markle's interview with Oprah Winfrey, Morgan went on a tear, accusing Markle of lying. I'm sorry, I don't believe a word she says, Meghan Markle. Well, that's a I wouldn't believe it if she read me a weather report. He ultimately left his job at Good Morning Britain over a back and forth about Markle on air. But Morgan maintains everything he said. He told Tucker Carlson in 2021, you know, she claimed they got married three days before the big global wedding we saw on television. I knew that. I knew that couldn't have happened because she said it was just the two of them with the Archbishop of Canterbury, the most powerful churchman in Britain. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are on their own financially after parting ways with the royal family. Forced to find a way to earn money, the duo has landed a couple of lucrative deals with major companies, with Netflix being one notable example. As part of that deal, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex brought a docuseries called Harry and Meghan to Life. The six-part series offered an inside look into the couple's journey, from the time they met to Megxit and into everyday life in their Montecito mansion with their two young kids. While many may have enjoyed watching the candid moments between the couple, others were not pleased with Markle once again putting herself front and centre after essentially begging for a life out of the public eye. Some found portions of the series downright offensive. Markle's story about the first time she'd met Harry's grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, for instance. I didn't know I was going to meet her until moments before. I remember we were in the car driving and he's like, you know how to curtsy, right? And I just thought it was a joke. Medieval times, dinner and tournament. It was like that. Like I curtsied as though I was like... In December 2020, Meghan Markle landed a deal with Spotify in connection with Archwell Studios, which she and Prince Harry co-founded. In August 2022, Markle launched a podcast called Archetypes. The series promised to showcase women across generations who conquered tropes in their lives to inspire a new generation, and featured guests such as Serena Williams, Jamila Jamil, and Issa Rae. The podcast wasn't successful, and the relationship between Spotify and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex came to an end. But it's what transpired next that made headlines. Spotify executive Bill Simmons called out Harry and Meghan on an episode of his own podcast, expressing happiness that the deal ended, saying, I wish I'd been involved in the Meghan and Harry leave Spotify negotiation. The f grifters. That's the podcast we should have launched with them. I gotta get drunk one night and tell the story of the Zoom I had with Harry to try and help him with a podcast idea. It's one of my best stories. Meanwhile, United Talent Agency CEO Jeremy Zimmer jumped on the anti-Markle wagon in a 2023 interview with Semaphore, saying, Turns out Meghan Markle was not a great audio talent or necessarily any kind of talent. And you know, just because you're famous doesn't make you great at something. When Meghan Markle entered Prince Harry's life, royal watchers everywhere were excited about what she would bring to the table. Many pictured an unstoppable force when she teamed up with Kate Middleton to take on the world. In his memoir, Spare, Harry wrote, I couldn't wait for them to meet her, that I looked forward to the four of us spending lots of time together, and I confessed, for the umpteenth time, that this had long been my dream, to join them with an equal partner, to become a foursome. As we know now, that never happened. Although they made some appearances together, Markle never built a strong connection with her sister-in-law, who is beloved by millions. And if you can't be besties with the future Queen of England, well, people will feed off that. And that's just what happened. Things got even worse when a report surfaced claiming that Markle made Middleton cry ahead of her wedding to Harry, something about the bridesmaid's tights. During her sit-down with Oprah Winfrey, Markle attempted to set the record straight, saying that it was actually the Princess of Wales that made her cry, but later apologised. 
but the narrative about, you know, making Kate cry, I think, was the beginning of a real character assassination, and mm -hmm. they knew it wasn't true. But most people had a hard time believing that. The reason? Markle's perceived penchant for embellishing the truth. 